Okay, I didn't get this video finished by the end of August like I was trying to do, but to be fair, Final Fantasy Unlimited itself wasn't properly finished either. Having debuted several months after the catastrophic box office failure of Spirits Within, what would have been a 52 episode run was cut down to 25. And instead of pulling a Sonic Underground and leaving the story half finished, Unlimited's creators decided to rush through the story, leaving a somewhat butchered shell of what could have been. That said, since I generally just watch the beginning, middle and ending episodes of any given show here on VidAMs, I don't think the rushed pacing is going to be a problem for me, so let's dive in. So off the bat, this show's opening is a mix of visual effects and concept art, which honestly feels like a direct visual representation of Square's financial struggles during this time. On the bright side though, this theme song is pretty good. Episode 1, Wonderland Journey into the Darkness, begins with a dark pillar appearing in an otherwise very normal looking city. A city which is very pleasant to look at in this art style, but does leave me slightly concerned that this is not going to feel very Final Fantasy at all. You know, kinda like Spirits Within. <laughs> However, the subsequent appearance of an early 2000s CGI dragon with a gun for a face absolutely put those fears to rest. Oh dear. I see someone has brought a sword dragon to a gun dragon fight. Ah, most anime narrators don't feel the need to introduce themselves, but I guess I appreciate the formality. Apparently, Fabula here also appears twice in the series to help the main characters, but otherwise she doesn't really do much, so we don't need to pay attention to her. <laughs> who we do need to pay attention to are I and you, a pair of kids who want to ascend the pillar and travel to the fabled Wonderland that lies on its other side a realm where they believe they'll find their lost parents, the two scientists we saw before. By the way, I hope you don't find classic 2D and early CGI animation too jarring when you mash them together, otherwise you're probably going to struggle to get immersed in this one. After boarding this mysterious train, I and you encounter Lisa, the world's worst spy. <laughs> Fuck, shit, uh, I was just... <laughs> well, it is a train, so you should be able to grab onto a bar. Or you could faceplant against the carriage door. I guess that works too. After travelling through the pillar, I, you and Lisa find themselves in Wonderland, which honestly makes for a very aesthetically interesting setting. <laughs> hmm. 
The real highlight of Wonderland, however, is this. Okay, we have a chocobo, and an incredibly cute one at that. This already feels more faithful to the series than Spirits Within. Whoa! <laughs> Enter the Edgelord! This man looks like a lost Naruto villain. And of course, he suffers from amnesia, only remembering that he holds a grudge against a certain someone. Before we really get to know him, though... Ugh. Sir, your vibes are atrocious. <laughs> Wait just a second. Oh shit. Um YouTube, I'm sorry. I didn't mean it. I didn't know. Please don't ban this one. Okay, I'm not gonna pretend this isn't cool as fuck. My 14 year old self would be having palpitations around this point. By the power of coloured dirt! Hmm... I'm not sure why... But I get a funny feeling that this lovingly crafted CGI animation of this gun being loaded and shot might appear at least 24 more times in this 25 episode run. Yep, it's still going. This is how you save money on an already constrained budget. Thankfully, with the different bullets leading to different summons, at least the payoff is different every time. And hey, summons! Another example of this being a faithful Final Fantasy adaptation. Oh no! I'm inexplicably inflating again! How embarrassing! <laughs> Okay, you know what? Chocobos, summons, and the victory theme all in episode one. This is all I could have asked for. Spirits within, take some goddamn notes. My impressions after that first episode are honestly pretty positive. It would have been nice to have a full party of adults or at least late teens to keep in line with the games, but with the show's slightly younger target demographic, I do understand the need for child protagonists. Jumping into the midpoint, we have episode 13, Meteor Abominable Memory, and through context clues, I can gauge that I, you, Lisa, and Kaze have been endlessly hounded by a group of evil generals. 
with Kaze on the ropes, the rest of the gang swoop in with their goddamn mech chocobo! Oh my god, this is amazing! Why the hell isn't this in the games? I want this! Well, dope as it may be, they do still manage to get caught by the evil General Fungus. <laughs> wow, Kase really came out here like, yeah, what? Fuck them kids. Most Final Fantasy villains spend their downtime acting dark and mysterious, so it's nice to see this Earl can have a good time with a bag of popcorn and a coke while his henchmen just hang out with him. This is a villainous work environment I think I can get behind. <laughs> So this creepy sword guy, Makenshi, is Kaze's rival. And during my watch party, this is where my friends figured out that he and Kaze were the dragons from the opening. You know, what with the guns and the swords and such. <laughs> Oh yeah, you know what this overwhelmingly bright scene needs? A flashbang. While Kaze and Mackenzie bump heads inside of the carnivorous flower, not something I thought I'd be saying today, Fungus informs I and you that Wonderland is actually in the process of conquering and assimilating other worlds, all to bestow godlike powers to the soda-chugging Earl. <laughs> right, so this Mega Man X looking fairy, who I have to imagine is someone that was introduced in the preceding 11 episodes, floats in with some kind of black dust. And when Fungus goes back to find and finish Kaze off, well, this genuinely disgusting shit happens. With Fungus now rotting to death and being completely immobilized, Kaze can just casually finish him off. How heroic of him. Hey ho, Kermit the Frog here. Nani! Mm, it's not easy being dead. Only a truly honorable opponent would impale me with a meteor while I was already dying. With Fungus down for good, we cut to the rest of the rogues gallery for their inputs. Only to realise that none of them give the slightest semblance of a shit. The Earl ominously asks how Chaos is doing, and Oscar here reassures him that all is well. And just as an aside, I love how Oscar's design leaves him in a constant state of I feel nothing, and I'm tired of your shit. Obviously, Kaze is okay. Otherwise, we wouldn't have someone to shoot his way through the rest of the series. Then again, maybe we could just have that fairy fly in and pour mold over everything. That seemed like a very effective method. Moving on to the penultimate episode, we have 24 Chaos the Earl Unveiled. In this one, Kaze and Makenshi are having another Draconic Spat, which... Oh hey! We got a Moogle too! Another tick for the list! 
After blowing Kaze away, Mackenzie hits the party with something of a plot dump, explaining that the sadistic little Earl is tied to the Dark God, Chaos. A being who feeds on fear and anxiety to reclaim his power. And worse, every time Kaze used his gun throughout this series, he was unknowingly powering Chaos up. Piling on with the bad news, the Earl has you captive, and seems to have some kind of control over his parents. Okay, so according to Lou the Werewolf here, Kaze's ammunition, the soil, is made out of the souls of the dead. Kind of like the live stream from Final Fantasy VII, or the fireflies from Final Fantasy X. All the spirits from Spirits Within. Square really liked defiling the dead during this time period. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> At this point, Mackenzie fully commits to double agency, becoming a full on ally, which the Earl is not particularly pleased with. And I will say this, the gross, uncanny looking CGI actually works pretty well when it's used to convey a gross, uncanny transformation. Wow, that was certainly a cliffhanger. Alright, how do they get out of this one? The final episode is Kaze, The Glory of Life. Most of this episode features I, you, Lisa, Kaze, and Mackenzie being tied up at the Earl's mercy, which allows him to psychologically torture them before he devours them and becomes one with chaos. A little bit messed up when you think about it. Damn, that is quite the fake out. This Earl is not fucking around. Oh no! The mold fairy was working for Oscar this whole time! Oh no! The corpse dirt! How's Kaze supposed to shoot his way out of this now? Jesus Christ, the odds were really stacked against our protagonists, weren't they? Which is especially wild when you consider that they are both 12. After revealing that the twins were also born from chaos and aren't even human, the Earl brings them both to the brink of despair, which for him would make them tastier. This episode is straight up fucked. <laughs>
With the horrifying rebirthing process being brought to a halt, Lou and the Moogle are able to fly in and dish out some damage, rescuing the twins, defeating the Earl's henchmen, and... Oh, this finale is really laying on the pathos. Well, I'll be damned. Another spirit absorbing spaghetti nightmare. Considering that this series is leagues better than Spirits Within, it sure is hitting some similar beats. Mackenzie allows himself to get munched by the Chaos Earl in a desperate attempt to hold him back from the inside. And Kaze is left to dish out the final shot, despite lacking any ammunition. And this, I did not expect. In order to dish out the final blow, Kaze uses the freshly made soil of Lou, who got to enjoy an appropriately sad and focused death scene, Moogle, who spontaneously self-destructs with very little pomp or circumstance, and then himself. With Kaze now being reduced to... bullets, Lisa fires the shots, and Kaze becomes the gun dragon once again. He flies up into the sky with the Chaos Earl Sword Dragon, they explode, series is over. No, really, that's it. We pan over the surviving cast, take one more look at Fabula, who is probably just as taken aback by this ending as we are, end of credits. So that was Final Fantasy Unlimited, and even within my format, I could feel how bisected this story was. A lot of the omitted or rushed over plot points, such as Kaze's backstory or the, you know, ending, the aftermath of the final encounter, were explored further in a series of books, radio dramas, and even a pair of games. Both of which were Japanese exclusives and barely exist in any capacity online. So, if there's any property that I would love to see revisited and maybe even remade by modern day, actually has money Squeenix, it would be this. As it is though, eh, it's alright, I guess. I like its art style for the most part, and I like that it does its own thing while still feeling true to the Final Fantasy formula, but otherwise it's just an average standalone fantasy anime. Nothing much to write home about. So with that, thank you for watching my month of Final Fantasy. I'm gonna take a long break from this series now, so head to Twitter and vote for my next episode. Special thanks to Anonymous, Dan Brown, Fitzwilliam Ramsbottom, Pixel Pusher, Romeo, Shameboy, Thomas Walker, and Toon Pirates.